record on this computer. Um, okay, I believe we are recording now. Okay, so hi everyone, nice to have you all here. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the World Horse Welfare um, uh, webinar that's just gone. We're a bit spoiled for webinars at the moment, aren't we? So I'm just about to share my screen and computer sound, share screen. And hopefully you will shortly see. Um, can you see the presentation? Um, let's just take, oh, uh, here we go. Yeah, we okay. can see it now. I'm just pressing play now. Hi, I'm Amelia and I'm going to talk a bit about the results of a questionnaire I created as part of my master's project. The focus of this was on the experiences of UK horse carers when restricting grass and taking their horses. If anyone listening took part, thank you very much for helping me with my project and taking the time to answer my questionnaire. So the aims of my study were to determine how commonly different methods of restricted grazing are used in the UK and how they're being implemented. To understand the barriers which limit the restricted grazing methods accessible to UK horse carers and to discover how effective UK horse carers found different restricted grazing methods and why they do some again but not others. For the purpose of my questionnaire I define restricted grazing as limiting a horse's access to pasture in some way with reduced access to pasture for whatever reason being the aim of the practice. This does not include instances such as an injured horse being kept on box rest or keeping a horse stable um, for lo longer during summer to keep it away from flies or heat. So I was interested in any practices used to reduce the ingestion of grass by horses or to manage pasture so it did not become damaged or overgrazed for example. So my main interest was on restricted grazing methods used to prevent obesity and laminitis or to manage metabolic disorders such as PPID or equine metabolic syndrome. As I'm sure you know, because it's probably the reason you're here, both obesity and laminitis are serious and potentially life-threatening diseases and one of the common ways of aiming to combat these diseases is by reducing calorie and sugar intake by limiting access to pasture. However, so the aim of restricting grazing is usually to improve equine physical welfare by preventing these diseases and associated issues. Some common methods may potentially impact other aspects of physical or psychological welfare by preventing natural, highly driven behaviours. Horses are trickle feeders, having evolved to graze about 16 to 18 hours per day. If forage intake is restricted too much, horses are prevented from eating anything for long periods. Gastric ulcers are more likely to develop. Ideally, horses should not be left without any kind of forage for more than four to five hours. Additionally, horses are a highly social species that have evolved to live in a herd. The use of some restricted grazing methods may mean that a horse is isolated from its normal social group, which can cause distress. This can leave owners in the difficult position of trying to balance their horse's different needs. I received 503 responses in total, and 93% of those respondents reported they had used restricted grazing methods before. I was also interested in the views of horse owners who had not restricted grazing for comparison, but today I'm going to focus on the experiences of those who had restricted grazing. Laminitis prevention or management was the most common reason restricted grazing had been used, um, cited by 81% of respondents, followed by preventing a horse from becoming overweight or because their horse is already overweight, reasons given by 77% um, and 52% respectively. Strict grazing was a method reportedly used by the greatest number percentage of respondents um, by 68, followed by grazing muzzles used by 61%. It's possible that more people may have used track systems than indicated, as this was not listed as a multiple choice option. This was because when I piloted my questionnaire, a lot of people didn't know what a track system was, and there was such a wide variety of ways these can be implemented. So I didn't want to confuse any respondents, and I thought that and people would use the other box to describe track systems if they were using them. The respondents were asked to rate how good they thought each method was in terms of welfare, on a Likert scale from very bad to very good. For analysis, I gave each rating a value from 1 to 5, with 1 representing very bad and 5 representing very good. The numbers displayed on the bar for each method represent the average score given by respondents. Strip raising was perceived to be the best welfare in stabling the worst. Perceived welfare impact was found to differ significantly between methods. However, in most cases, the perceived welfare impact of a method did not relate to how likely respondents were to have used this method. This may suggest that owners are often not able to use their preferred method to limit grazing, as presumably they would choose the method they thought was best for welfare. I also just wanted to clarify as well that these scores don't necessarily actually represent how good each method is for equine welfare, 
just how good questionnaire respondents perceive them to be. So the idea that owners may not be able to use their preferred methods is supported by the fact that 24% reported management restrictions at their yard, with rules such as set turnout hours or no use of temporary fencing, for example, limiting the methods available to those horse owners. 52% ease of implementation influence the method chosen, as some methods are much more labour intensive and require more time to set up than others. For example, strip grazing normally requires fencing to be set up and moved daily. 24% also cited costs and influencer, saying they were unable to afford to implement some methods. For 13%, there was only one method available to them, which may be the case for a variety of reasons. Grazing muzzles were rated the second lowest of welfare, but were the second most commonly used method possibly because they are a fairly cheap option, typically only incurring a one-off cost and requiring minimal labour and no specific yard setup or facilities compared to other methods. It appeared that horse carers' key priorities when choosing a method are how effective it is, how easy it is to implement and manage, whether the horse seems happy with the method, and that the horse is able to have the most normal life possible with an emphasis on access to company and forage. The horse can engage in voluntary exercise and how cheap or cost effective the method is. However, um, though respondents tended to agree on these priorities, they did not agree on whether each method met these. This indicates owners are having very different experiences using the same methods. Factors such as yard facilities, grass type and availability, the way the method is being used and individual differences in horses are all likely to contribute to these varying experiences. Respondents were asked which methods they had tried would, would they or would they not use again. This graph shows, out of the respondents that said they had used the method, what percentage said they would and would not use the method again, and what percentage didn't mention whether they would or not they would use it again. Track systems aren't included in this graph, as more people said they would use them again than originally said they had used them. I think this may be because track systems weren't included as a multiple choice answer on the original question asking which methods people had used. However, it does indicate that most of those who had tried track systems generally seem to like them. Some methods seem to polarise opinion. For example, similar numbers said they would use stone again, as said they would not, and high numbers said they would and would not use muzzles again. Muzzles are vote and especially strong responses from some, and they referred to some as torture devices, and some respondents reported they were unable to use muzzles as other people, either strangers or at their yards, would remove them. This is extremely dangerous, as the horse may be left for many hours on lush grass, possibly consuming enough to bring on the first symptoms of laminitis that same day. Strip grazing appeared to be the overall preferred method, as well as being rated highest in terms of welfare, the greatest percentage said they would use this method again, while only a small number said they would not. So now I'm going to talk a bit about each of the six methods most commonly used by respondents in my questionnaire, um, which are the five displayed on screen plus track systems. Um, and I'm going to summarise the main advantages and disadvantages that respondents found with each of them, um, although bear in mind that these may not represent the actual benefits and disadvantages, just what other people's experiences were. Um, so they may not all apply to every person. Um, I'll focus on strip grazing and grazing muzzles as I have collected the most data on these. There are also several other options available for managing grazing, such as equicentral or rotational grazing, for example. Um, and some people have been quite creative in developing their own strategies. But these are the six methods I've been able to gather the most information on. So I'm going to talk about these today. Um, so, type A strip grazing, shown in the first diagram, involves two mobile, often parallel fences, moving the same distance up the field each time. Um, so, the paddock size stays approximately the same. Each time the fence is moved, um, the paddock will comprise of some new ungrazed grass, as well as some previously grazed grass. And um, grass no longer within these fences will be able to rest. For type B, there is only one mobile fence which travels up the field while all others remain in place, so the paddock size increases gradually. For type C, the entire strip is moved, so the whole paddock is made to a fresh grass each time. This is technically a form of rotational grazing. Slightly more respondents use type B than type A, with some people describing in the other box how they use the combination of both these techniques. A recent study by Harris and Longland found that both type A and type B strip grazing successfully reduced weight gain compared to ponies that were not strip grazed at all. The main benefits um, of strip grazing reported by respondents were that horses could be turned out and exercised and that it allowed them to express natural behaviour. Um, also that they could be with companions. 
People's main concerns were that horses would engage in compensatory eating or gorging when the strip was first moved, and some people were also worried that exercise may actually be reduced. When asked if they had experienced any issues with this method, 41% of those who had strip raised said they had not. The most common issue reported was, uh, was horses escaping, something experienced by 38%. While the next most commonly reported issue was pasta damage, but this was only experienced by 8%. Additionally, 18% um, of people that hadn't had a horse escape were concerned about this happening, while 21% were also concerned about pasta damage. Escaping poses a big issue, um, as horses may injure themselves or get access to very lush grass. If using electric fencing, it's important to check this is working and you can get some devices fairly cheaply to do this. Also, if using a battery, it could be useful to set a regular reminder um, to charge this rather than waiting for it to run out. And some people find solar power batteries and energizers useful. Adding enrichment may also help to keep horses interested and decrease attempts to escape and also increase exercise. Townsend's weight management guide is a really good place to start to get some enrichment ideas. Also, if you're worried about your horse gorging when the strip is first moved, using a grazing muzzle may help to slow down consumption. Alternatively, if you don't move the strip every day, you could consider moving it more regularly by, by a smaller amount, although this will obviously make the method a bit more labour intensive. So, for grazing muzzles, most respondents had used the wave and bar basket type muzzle with a solid base and single hole in the bottom, um, which is shown in the first picture. Um, followed by the green guard style muzzle with multiple slats to graze through, and then a plastic bucket style muzzle with either a single or multiple holes. None of the respondents from my questionnaire reported using a flexible fillies muzzle, which is shown on the end here. Um, and as far as I know, it's only been available very recently and was not on the market last year when my questionnaire was online, although I could be mistaken. I just thought I'd mention this new muzzle in case some people hadn't heard of it and would be interested in looking into it for their horses. There have been several studies carried out into grazing muzzles, um, which have found they can be effective at decreasing weight gain and dry matter intake, through, um, though to varying extents. The National Equine Welfare Council have a useful leaflet and video offering guidance on using and introducing muzzles, which is worth looking at if you're thinking of using one. Grazing muzzles seem to divide opinion the most, and some people found they were very effective and suited their horses, whereas others had had very negative experiences with them. Only 12% reported that they had not experienced any issues with muzzles, which is much lower than for strip grazing. The main benefits identified were that horses could be turned out and exercised and they could be with companions, um, as well as being able to trickle feed. Whereas the limitations reported were that muzzles rubbed or caused sores on the horse's face, which were only 43% of muzzle users had experienced. 35% also said that their horse was able to remove the muzzle um, and compensatory eating or gorging when the muzzle was moved was a concern. Some respondents observed changes in social interactions and herd dynamics after a horse is muzzled. Muzzles getting caught on a horse's foot or things in the field, um, negative impacts on behaviour or psychological welfare, such as stress frustr on frustration and abnormal dental wear, were all also identified as potential issues by 29%, 26% and 25% of muzzle users respectively. However, these were only reported as an issue by 4%, 13% and 9% respectively. While these are still clearly important issues that can have a negative impact on horses' welfare, it may be less prevalent than owners think, and there may be ways to reduce their occurrence. Um, I'm going to go through a few ways that you can try and address some of the common muzzling issues. I do think muzzles can be a useful tool, especially as they're accessible to most people because they don't require a particular yard setup or facilities. Even if horses are frustrated initially, they can usually learn to accept muzzles and they've been shown to be effective. However, there may be some horses that just don't suit muzzles and don't learn to accept them, and different strategies will have to be used for these horses. The National Equine Welfare Council has a useful guide for using, fitting and introducing muzzles which may be helpful to anyone using them. I also just wanted to start by saying I'm not trying to advocate any particular brand of muzzle, because every horse is different um, and has a different face shape, so the type that works best will likely vary from horse to horse. Hopefully I'll be able to provide a bit of information that may help people to make informed decisions. So rubs and sores may be due to muzzles being poorly designed or not fitting properly. But it's important to check your horse's face regularly for any signs of rubbing such as bull patches to take action before they become sores. When purchasing a muzzle, I'd recommend going for a brand that has some kind of fitting guide or one that um, you can find the muzzle circumference for. 
especially for the woven basket type muscles. If the sizing is just pony, full or cob, for example, this usually isn't very helpful. My 11 2 pony has a short head but a chunky nose and needed a cob-sized muzzle as she couldn't open her mouth properly in a pony-sized one. This can cause rubbing and also frustration as the horse won't be able to eat properly. Choosing muzzle with fleece or padding may also help prevent rubbing, or adding your own padding could also help. If you're thinking of buying a green guard muzzle, they have a fitting guide on the website and a list of common reasons for rubbing and how to prevent this. I don't know much about the flexible fillies muzzles, as I've never used them and don't know anyone that has, as they appear to be fairly new. But they claim to be designed of soft, um, softer and lighter material. I've been reading quite a lot of reviews about these, and um, people often seem to comment that they don't rub when other types have. So this product could be worth exploring if you have an issue with rubbing with other types of muscles. Compensatory eating, where horses eat more when grazing after a period of restriction to make up for the reducing grass intake, can be an issue with any method of restricted grazing. Therefore, it's not recommended to allow horses to re-access the pasture after using a method of restricted grazing. For example, when allowing your horse time without being muzzled, consider using a starvation or bare paddock or strip grazed area, and the same goes for um, other methods too. It's important to observe your horse when first turned out the mother with, muzzled with other horses to see how they interact with each other and ensure the muzzled horse is still accepted by the herd. Muzzles do not allow mutual grooming, which is important for bonding, so it may be a good idea to allow your horses some time unmuzzled to interact with companions, even if this is just a short time turned out together in a sound school, for example. This may also help reduce frustration caused by social interactions being limited. The potential cause of frustration is if horses are unable or don't understand how to graze with the muzzle on. Grass length will impact this, as if it's too short, horses will not be able to eat through the muzzle. But grass that's too long, over about 10 centimetres, may also be harder to eat, as it's likely to squash down flat and not stick through the hole of the muzzle. Making sure the horse has enough space to open its mouth and chew properly is also important. The way muzzles are introduced may also influence how likely they are, horses are to feel frustrated or be able to successfully eat. About one fifth of respondents said they introduced muzzles abruptly by just putting the muzzle on and turning the horse out. Though some horses are able to work out how to use a muzzle on their own, others may struggle and become frustrated or distressed and, um, at not being able to graze. Introducing the muzzle gradually may reduce this initial frustration and such as using positive reinforcement like treats or feed to reward the horse for putting the muzzle on and feeding treats or grass through the muzzle. Taking your horse to graze in hand so you can feed, feed grass through the muzzle and assist in grazing if necessary may help the horse um, also learn how to graze. One questionnaire respondent um, also reported buying several muzzles with the, ty um, the type with the single hole on the bottom and enlarging the hole by various amounts. This way the horse could start grazing with a larger hole and once it could do this comfortably, then one with a smaller hole could be introduced. This may be a beautiful method for horses struggling to learn to graze and there are several brands of this star muzzle that are fairly cheap. However, care must be taken to ensure there are no sharp edges if you enlarge the hole yourself and it should be checked regularly to ensure it's not wearing unevenly, which would um, also cause sharp edges and rubbing. Washing the base of the muzzle after each use to remove any sand and grit that might rub against teeth may reduce the likelihood of abnormal dental wear. Potentially, dental wear may be more likely if grass is very short and horses are pushing down hard on the muzzle to graze. So checking horses are not struggling to eat due to grass being very short may also reduce this risk. Stabling was considered worse for welfare by respondents, and not many people listed benefits of this method, or there were lots of negative lists listed, although 50% had used this method. However, stabling is usually necessary to treat acute laminitis, as it allows owners to have complete control of what their horse is eating, and also reduces stress um, to the weakened lamini that's associated with moving. There's lots of research showing that horses can find it stressful to be socially isolated from their companions, which is unnatural for them meaning stabling horses 24-7 long-term usually isn't the best option for welfare. Horses should also be provided with forage if they'll be stabled more than a few hours. The main reported benefits of stabling were that the owner could monitor exactly what their horse was eating um, and that it removes any risk associated with grass consumption. In comparison, perceived disadvantages were that the horse would not have much space and exercise would be reduced, reducing calories burnt. Um, also that stabling could cause stress, frustration or boredom, um, that it may limit horses' ability to display natural behaviour and could potentially lead to other physical wealth issues. For example, long periods standing still could exacerbate arthritis. 
The stress due to social isolation can be a big issue with stabling, and some horses may still be feeling distressed even if they're not showing obvious signs such as vocalising. For horses that are kept stable 24-7, it may be beneficial to allow them some time where they can interact freely with other horses, even if this is just a short time in the sand school. Providing enrichment such as scratching pads may help alleviate boredom, um, as can using a slow feeder or similar because horses will spend less time and nothing to do. Slow feeders may also reduce the likelihood um, of gastric ulcers developing if horses are on limited forage fashion. By starvation paddock, I mean a field with very little grass in it, and despite the name, horses are not supposed to be starved. If available grass does not provide enough forage, this should be supplemented, for example, with soaked hay. The name Staff Asian Paddock may put people off as it has negative connotations, and some might find a term such as fair paddocks preferable. The main benefits identified um, by respondents for the horses could be outside and exercise, that they could be turned out with companions, and that they allow horses to perform natural behaviour. Their concerns were that starvation paddocks may cause stress, frustration, or boredom, um, as the environment may be quite barren. For some, reduced space um, and exercise is also a worry. This could be a possibility as starvation paddocks may be made fairly small so it doesn't take long for them to be grazed down. So this will vary on an individual basis. Also grazing short stressed grass was a concern as this may contain more sugar. And respondents were also worried about the potential of sand colic from horses trying to ingest short grass. Um, they were also worried that they may be left without forage for long periods or be isolated if other horses did not share the same nutritional needs as them. Though shorter, newer grass may contain more sugar, if horses are ingesting much less than they would on longer, more mature grass, it's possible for them to be in a calorie deficit and still lose weight. If owners are concerned about this though, soaked hay may be provisioned as well, which horses will likely find easier to eat than the short grass. This could be also be done if sand colic is a concern and can be fed off the ground, for example in a manger, to further reduce risk of sand ingestion. Again, providing enrichment or supplementary forage in creative ways can help to alleviate boredom and encourage exercise. Yard or arena turnout, also known as a crew yard or in the USA a dry lot, um, is where horses are turned out onto a grass-free area and usually provided with forage, which will be needed if the horse is being kept there for more than a few hours. Lots of respondents seem to think this option offered good welfare for horses, but many were unlikely to have the facilities at their yard to use this method. And if the yard did have a sand school, they were usually not allowed to turn their horse out in this. Respondents mentioned they found similar benefits to starvation paddocks with yard turnout, as well as saying it was an advantage and any risk associated with grass was removed, and that they could control the forage consumed by their horse. Similar disadvantages to starvation paddocks were also identified, although obviously any risk associated with consuming short stress grass was removed. If using an arena surface with sand, people were also concerned that ingestion of sand could lead to colic or that it could be bad for their airways. Again, providing forage off the ground, such as in a hay net or manger, reduces the chances of ingestion um, of sand if your turnout area is a sandy or dusty surface. But if you think your horse is especially susceptible to sand colic or has a cough, for example, turning it into a sandy surface may not be suitable. If multiple horses are turned out together, providing separate forage piles or feeding stations can help to reduce competition between horses. Track systems are based off the paddock paradise system designed by Jem Jackson, and this diagram is from his book. Track systems typically involve fencing the perimeter around a field, although a path could be snaked back and forth to make use of all available space. According to Jackson, they should ideally be grass-free and feature a number of different areas, such as feeding areas, watering holes, shelter, and different surfaces to promote natural behaviour. However, fencing a track around the field without all these additional features or without being grass-free may still promote increased exercise. But doing things such as spreading out small feeding stations, for example, may still be necessary, as if all forage is provided in one area, the track alone may um, not encourage extra movement. More people had used track systems than I was expecting, which is great. Um, and of these people, only a few reported that they would not use this method again in the future, compared to the vast majority that said they would. Track systems were also by far the method most respondents said they would like to try in the future, with 44% of people that said there were other methods they hadn't tried but wanted to listing track systems. A big issue from preventing people from trying this method is they likely do not have the facilities to do so. 
If you do not own your own land or are not at a yard with a track system, you will likely have to ask permission from the yard or landowner who may not be keen on this idea. Track system users reported advantages as increased exercise, ability to perform natural behaviours, and the ability to be turned out with companions. This advantage is brought up that if not grass free, which may not be possible or desirable in some cases, the track could become grazed down so the grass was short and stressed and likely contain more sugar. Parcel damage was also a concern and could put off landowners if they may wish to use the field for other purposes in the future. Jackson's Park in Paradise is also set up in California and it's likely the terrain in the UK is quite different and more likely to become very wet and muddy in the winter, meaning poaching could occur. I was also worried that horses may escape from the track onto lush grass in the centre of the field. More research needs to be conducted into track systems to better understand how they can be implemented to be most successful. Which is why Tamsin's current questionnaire is going to be really important. As I mentioned regarding other methods, horses can still lose weight when grazing short grass with provision of another forage source such as soaked hay and will encourage them to eat this instead and will be necessary if a grass tree track is being used. Spacing forage out along the track can also help promote exercise. And again, regular checking of electric fencing can help prevent escapes and adding enrichment features will encourage natural behaviour. Hopefully raising awareness of, um, of these, this method and other alternative grazing systems may encourage more yard owners to set these up or allow them, as currently using methods such as this may not be possible for some if they do not only manage the land where their horse is kept. This study found that horse carriers mainly restrict grazing with the aim of improving welfare and preventing health issues. Individual horse carriers may have different opinions of welfare impact of each method. However, perceived welfare impact is not the only influence over which method horse carriers use. Factors such as ease of implementation, cost, and yard rules or facilities can limit the options available for restricting grazing. This means horse carriers may be dissatisfied with the methods they're using due to them not being their preferred choice. Strip grazing appeared to be the method favoured by the greatest number of respondents, while track systems were the method most wanted to try in the future. The overall widely different opinions were held over which method was best for welfare. In general, respondents tended to have similar priorities when residing on a restricted grazing method and a good understanding of horses' welfare needs. However, they did not agree on whether method, different methods met these welfare needs and had had very different experiences using the same methods. As every horse is different and horse owners will have access to varying facilities, different restricted grazing methods are likely to be best suited to different horse owner combinations. Thank you for listening. I hope you found my talk interesting. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me during the discussion at the end. Great. So thank you very much, Amelia. I'm not talking to myself. Amelia is, has joined us here. Um, so, Tamsin, Hello. I think you are up next. Brilliant. Yeah, hi everyone. I um, hope you enjoyed Amelia's talk. Um, I know I did. We're really lucky to have her here with us. Um, she is here as well. So, um, what we'll probably do is wait for uh, questions at the end and then Dee, Amelia and I um, will take questions all together if that's okay. Um, but feel free to write them in the comments now while they're fresh in your mind if you want and then we'll collect them. Um, so, we'll collect them as we go. Um, so, uh, oh, just quickly, I'm just going to say, um, as the talk has been going, I've put some very useful links there for everyone, uh, for some of the resources uh, mentioned in the talk, and also to the alternative grazing system questionnaire. If you guys haven't already filled it out, please uh, do so. Thank you, much appreciated. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, hopefully, this will work. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, can you see my screen now? Is that yes. Working? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Hang on. No, I've put the thing in the wrong place, so I can't share it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Brilliant. <laughs> so thank you. So um, I'm Tamsin, as you all know. So I'm just going to do um, a relatively brief talk about how to decide on all those weight management strategies that Amelia took us through. How to decide on what's going to be right for your horse um, and, and find something that works for you uh, with the you know things that are going on in your life and what you can and uh, can't do physically and so on um, on your yard and what you're allowed to do and also what's going to work for your horse and your horse's personality and so on. 
Um, because really what we try and kind of say is there's not one option that's the best as you saw in Amelia's presentation I think quite clearly there's not one option that's just going to be right and the magic answer for every horse um, or every situation um, but instead we have to find what's going to suit the, the individual. So when we talk to people about um, the difficulties that they have in terms of managing their horse's weight, um, they often might say things like, um, like in the examples here, which I totally understand and hear wholeheartedly and agree with, having experienced many of these myself. Um, so maybe the horse won't wear a grazing muzzle, maybe the horse escapes from the field, the horse can't be risen, ridden, maybe they're elderly or they've got an injury, um, feel guilty seeing the horse hungry, um, not allowed to move fields, um, and so on so you know we get lots of um, things that you can't do um, and people also tend to want to have a lot of details about the specifics that they should be doing so how many hours should you soak your hateful for example or um, exactly what times can you turn your horse out to make the grazing safer but what we say is it's a bit easier to think instead of thinking of the things you can do we try and swap it round, and instead of focusing on the um, the kind of the, the narrow bits about, you know, how many hours to soak your hay for, think a bit bigger. So think about the things you can do and think about the slightly bigger picture. Um, and then that helps to kind of plan your weight management. And what I mean when I say that is um, that what we, the way we think of it is, um, is to split weight management into these four, four sections, reducing grazing, altering supplementary feed, using the horse's metabolism or increasing exercise. What I mean by that is that um, there are lots of different things you can use to manage weight. So as we saw, you know, using a track system, using a grazing muzzle, um, Amelia talked about all the things that were about reducing grazing, but there's also lots of things you can do like soaking hay, for example, exercising your horse in lots of different ways and so on. Um, so if we split those into basically things that are about calories in versus calories out, then we end up with these four sections. So if we think about uh, things that are going to reduce what's going into the horse, then that's the top two sections. So we can think about reducing the amount of grass the horse is going to be having or reducing the amount of feed that we're giving it. And by supplementary feed, I mean um, things like um, hay and haylage um, treats as well as uh, bucket feed. Um, or we can increase the amount of energy, energy expenditure that the horse is having. So that could be exercise, which could be riding or lunging um, or horse walker, but could also be a myriad of the ways that there are of exercising horses, including um, turning them out on a hill or <laughs> turning them out with youngsters, driving, agility, whatever, you name it. Um, as long as the horse is moving, it counts. Um, or using the horse's metabolism. So, um, as we know, um, and Dave McFarland's written a lot on this, um, that horses um, are very different from us in how they heat themselves up. So um, because they ferment um, some of what they eat in their gut, in their hind gut, that creates heat. So that doesn't happen with us, which is why we have to keep ourselves warm with clothes. But um, with horses, it's exactly the same as if you cut a pile of grass, you know, if you cut your grass um, and you've got a pile of grass cuttings and you put your hand in it, um, it's warm, that's because it's fermenting. And that's exactly the same as what's happening in a horse's gut. So they're heating themselves basically from the inside out. Um, and therefore um, they, they can, um, and they can heat themselves up very effectively. So if it's cold in the winter, for example, they can then use their energy to kind of complement that system and heat themselves up far better than we can. So if we put rugs on, they don't have to do that. But if we uh, don't put rugs on, or even if we clip them to encourage them to do it a bit more, then they will just use their own. They don't feel the cold like we do until it gets to much lower, maybe five degrees or lower. Um, but they can use their own energy to keep warm. So what I thought I'd do is take you through a couple of examples. And if you were um, examples of how we'll plan this. And if you were on the webinar last week, we met, um, we met some horses whose owners had really kindly um, sent in some pictures for us to condition score. And um, those owners have also provided us some information about how they manage their horses and how they're going to be thinking about their weight management. So we're going to use them um, as examples to think about how you could plan effective weight management strategies in the very different situations that each of those horses is in. So for every horse, um, we're going to go through and think about those four quadrants. Oops, sorry, that's not coming up yet. Think about those four quadrants. So. Um, there are four questions then um, relating to each one. So firstly, can the horse do any exercise at all, even if that's very light exercise? Um, if the horse doesn't, can't do any exercise, then obviously we just can rule that out completely um, and we can just focus on the other three areas. 
Um, does the horse have any supplementary feed, um, whether that's in a bucket or whether that's hay or haylage? Again, some people will need to manage their horse's weight and they won't be giving it anything extra. So if you know that, you can just rule out that part of the diagram. Um, is the horse rugged um, or could it be clipped? Um, and if so, then there's definitely something you can do there, which will help to manage the horse's weight by not rugging it, uh, rugging it less. Um, and does the horse have any time at all out on grass? And of course, most horses will, in which case there is something we can do to manage their weight. And then you can just think about what's going to work for you. So, you know, we quite often have people who are quite worried about horses, um, ulcers, for example, or the horse being stressed, which is totally understandable, and people not wanting to really diet their horses. Um, and, you know, you can actually um, reduce a horse's weight purely through exercise if you if you want to but you might have to exercise the horse quite hard but that's the trade-off so we don't need to necessarily just be thinking about how many hours we so came for um, if we think about this kind of bigger picture and the different um, ways that we can manage weight um, one of the key questions that we need to think about every time is how urgent is the weight loss? And that kind of comes through in some of the case studies because some of these horses were already on the way to losing weight um, and are already at, um, you know, relatively good weight, you know, a little overweight, but not too much, in which case their weight loss is probably not quite as urgent um, as some others. But if your horse uh, is increasing weight, you have laminitis concerns, um, then of course it's much more urgent and you're going to need to um, weigh up how many of these sorts of um, weight management strategies you put in place a lot more, um, you know, to, you're going to have to be a lot less lenient basically. Um, so we're going to be um, thinking about that in terms of um, each of the case studies. So we'll just start off. Uh, first of all, you might remember this uh, lovely chestnut pony. Um, this is a rescue pony. She's only nine um, and her owner's just had her since uh, January. And when she arrived, she was overweight, but she's actually lost a reasonable amount already. Um, if you remember, we condition scored this pony at a 3.5 out of five, um, which means she is, which is just, you know, very slight, is a little bit of overweight there. Um, you can watch the recording if you want to see how we did that. Um, but she is a very interesting shape because she had um, some terrible accidents involving falling on her withers. Um, so, um, so she's got the kind of crushed shape there on her withers. That means she also can't be ridden, although she can do in hand exercise. So as you can see there, so she can't be ridden, which tells us something about the weight management. And also she's not very overweight. The owner's already got her to lose a reasonable amount of weight. So she's already on the right track. So we know that this is just gentle maintenance rather than anything urgent. Um, because of her, um, the difficult situations she's been in, the owner is really keen to avoid any additional stress on this pony, um, totally understandably. Um, and um, finally, she's at a livery um, in a field on her own. And although the owner would like to use a track system, um, she's not allowed to do anything like that on the yard. Um, so, so that's this pony. So, oh, sorry. And also she's um, in a stable at night, including in summer um, and then out in the daytime. So we've got this situation and this is the, you know, the point with weight management. We need to be thinking about the individual situation and what each horse can manage. So this pony, um, obviously saying ridden exercise is not going to be very helpful. So how can we think about different things that this pony can do? Well, we take the first quadrant, so a top left there, reducing grazing. Well, we know that she's out in a field um, at the moment, but the owner can't do very much to alter that field. So um, what else could we do to reduce the amount of grass in the field? Well, you could look for a friend to help eat down some of the grass. And in fact, that's something that the owner is actually doing. And that would be a really nice, um, you know, high welfare way of reducing this pony's weight because you'd have less grass, but she also then has a friend in there with her. So perfect. Another option, if you can't alter anything in your field by setting up a track system or strip grazing, is obviously to use a grazing muzzle. Now, we know that this pony needs to avoid any additional stress, so it would be a case of um, introducing that very slowly if you wanted to do it, um, and finding which muzzle worked for her, probably using positive reinforcement um, clicker training, um, for example, as well, to get her used to it. Um, but because we know that her weight management isn't urgent because she's already losing weight, we could probably leave that till further down the line um, if what she's doing isn't working. Um, so the next one, thinking about altering the supplementary feeds. Well, this pony's in a stable for 12 hours. So she is having, um, she is obviously having um, hay and, um, and feeds as well. Um, the, um, so 
if, she, if she's in a stable, that means that there is some supplementary feed going in and therefore we can think about reducing the calorie load on that supplementary feed. So for example, she could think about soaking the hay, perhaps having some straw. Um, you can mix hay and straw together as forage and that's been shown in some studies to have a really good effect um, in terms of reducing weight because it's basically just kind of empty calories. It's like eating celery really. Um, now they don't get much nutrition from it so you need to be feeding um, a balance or, um, or you know vitamin mineral supplements um, and ensure they're getting enough protein but that is a way of reducing the amount of calories that are going in in their supplementary forage if that's what you want to do um, and again considering bucket feed now the owner when she talks about the bucket feed um, she's not getting a huge amount anyway so that's probably not going to help hugely here but is an option then thirdly um, so we talked about how this pony can't be ridden, um, but the owner is keen to do other things with her. So she's already doing some in hand exercising and taking her out for walks and things. Oh, sorry. Well, sorry. What have I done? Oh. Um, she's already taking her out for walks and things, um, but she could increase that and do a bit more. She is working with a physio for the withers issue and so on as well. So, um, so that's fantastic. And also um, means that she could kind of work with the physio to do perhaps some more of that to help build the pony up. And, you know, it's really nice to do things here like setting goals, for example, maybe um, agility, for example, it's becoming really popular um, as in the picture on the right there. It's not the same pony. This is a friend pony um doing some doing some agility there standing on a platform with a ball and an umbrella really good de-spooking um interesting for the horse and fun for the owner as well um, and we'll talk more about those sorts of activities later on and then finally um i don't know if this pony does wear rugs but i have a new mantra no rugs without reason so um if we have a horse that's overweight then we shouldn't ever, ever be rugging them as standard. So if that, that we need to think, is there a reason to rug this horse? So is the horse, for example, old? Is the horse suffering um, if I don't put the rug on it? Um, and you know, then absolutely fair enough. But if the horse is overweight, they shouldn't even fly rugs. They shouldn't have them on just for the sake of having a rug on. Um, so uh, for example, I've got a friend um, whose pony has, they've got like a cob pony. And if she doesn't wear a fly rug, then she'll walk around not in a distressed way um, and to, to get the flies off. She's not particularly concerned by it, but it is helping her move. Um, on the other hand, if you were to do that with perhaps a thoroughbred or a thin skin one or a cob who's a worrier, um, they might not like it very much. But even fly rugs, we shouldn't be putting on unless there's a reason to do it, unless we're avoiding suffering, okay? Um, so no rugs without reason. Then um, these two, um, if you remember them, they were owned by the same person. Um, the Bay is a really good example of a pony who um, condition scores very interestingly. So you look at her and think here she looks in absolutely, I would have said from this picture, absolutely a three perfect condition. But actually when we condition scored her, she was um, there, she, uh, with in more detail with the owner and more pictures and so on. Um, she is uh, a kind of easily a four condition score. Um, that's the bay. And then the gray Highland Pony there on the right is a 4.5. So um, this owner um, has both these horses and she rents her own land and she currently strip grazes these two. The Grey is an escape artist um, and will jump out of anything she doesn't like very much, which is a bit of an issue. And I think we all know that, especially with these lovely native types um, <laughs> who are very clever. Um, the Grey pony can be ridden. Um, the Bay can't, but she can be worked in hand and she can be taken on hacks and so on with the Grey. Um, as I said, the owner has control over her land. She's got three acres just for these two horses and she can do whatever she likes with it. So, what can this owner do? Um, so let's do this example using the four different quadrants. So first of all, in terms of reducing grazing. So what could she do in terms of um, changing the grazing? Well, she's lucky because she's got control of the land. So that means she could think about, for example, maybe using, uh, she's already strip grazing. She could think about a track system, for example. Um, although actually she was saying she's concerned about with a track getting little enough grass on the outside of it that it will actually work for them because both horses um, are re she's concerned about both of their weight um, and they're not necessarily losing straight away so getting little enough grass on the outside in the, in the first place for it to be a, a useful track is a bit of an issue. 
she could use a grazing muzzle um, and she's concerned about both of their weight um, a bit more than maybe the others that we'll see so um, it is a bit more urgent so a grazing muzzle might be a kind of quicker uh, quick and easy way to um, work this out for her um, but um, it will depend of course on the horses. Um, finally, um, for reducing grazing, she could just get some more horses. It's always nice when someone tells you to get more horses, right? Um, so she could increase the number of animals on the lands, perhaps with horses or maybe uh, with sheep, for example. Sheep are horse people's friends. Um, if you can borrow some off a farmer. So in terms of altering supplementary feed, um, so she's in the situation where they're strip grazed and on a, a bare paddock, but they do have some soaked hay in there. So depending on how bare that paddock really is, we could think about reducing that. Oops, sorry. Sorry, my arrows are being weird. Um, she could think about reducing that. Um, usually, even if it looks like a bare paddock, we're so lucky in this country, but they still are getting some grass on there. Um, it's really amazing how little they need as well. Um, so yeah, could think about reducing the, um, the soaked hay, but obviously it depends um, on the individual situation um, and the horses involved as well. And um, these horses ha do have some bucket feed. It's quite a small amount compared to the grazing that they'll get. But again, we always need to be reconsidering what bucket feed we're giving and checking that it's the right um, you know the right amount and um, you know they, they need to have obviously the right vitamins and minerals and so on but um, it's always a good idea just to check that you're, you've got the right amounts and so on. Then of course we've got two native ponies uh, both of them overweight so no rugs without reason um, we don't want any rugs on these guys unless you know we have you know some specific purpose for having the rugs so that will really help them and this owner could think about maybe clipping them in winter sometimes just giving them a bit of a belly clip um, can really really help and it is actually really surprising having been there myself with um, an overweight Welsh cob it is actually really surprising how much um, um, not rugging a horse or even not rugging it as much um, does actually help them to uh, reduce their weight it's quite surprising and it's so easy as well it's like less work for you so I'm really as you can tell a big advocate for that um, in terms of increasing exercise so we know that this pony uh, that the gray pony can um, be ridden so that's great but also this owner is thinking about this track system um, so the track's great here if she can get the ponies to actually exercise on it, um, but it does depend on the horses and setup. So some of them will kind of just stand around. Um, so you do need some a system that's going to make them move. So the lovely one on the right hand side there with no grass at all on it. Um, so if she can make a system with little enough grass where they will actually move, then fantastic. The track will be really helpful. Um, then we talked about riding, but also the in-hand work. So again, maybe setting some goals. So setting some kind of monthly mileage hacking and leading goals. Um, we'll talk about those later or whatever, just the, whatever this owner just finds fun. So again, this is quite a different situation to the chestnut pony that you saw first. So we've got quite different um, responses um, th that would be useful for her in comparison, just because her setup is completely different. And then completely different again, we've got this PRE um, who you might have seen um, last week. So he was condition scored at a four. Um, and this is him on the bottom left in his um, heyday when he was very, very fit. But unfortunately, he's had a series of injuries um, and he's now coming back into work. Um, but he put on a bit of lockdown paunch um, like many of us. <laughs> so um, he's currently a four, um, but he is currently losing that weight. So his, um, the physio and and owner are working together very closely and are happy that his weight's going down. So this is non-urgent weight loss. Um, and the middle two there would be, um, I think the owner feels like it would be better to crack on a bit more than maybe this pony and the, the, the chestnut that you saw at the start. So um, a little less urgent here, but this guy, so he's on full livery um, and he's in at night and he goes out in the day for a few hours on a fairly bare paddock. And the owner doesn't have any control over that paddock so she can't strip graze it or anything. Um, he is worked six times a week, uh, mainly hacking and um, works with the physio, um, but he is quite lively, according to his owner. Uh, so a lot of the work has to be kind of a, um, you know, that, that interim between trying to not wind him up because he's, he's supposed to be rehabbing from an injury, uh, but also working him enough to, um, you know, to obviously, uh, well, A, reduce some calories, but also build the right muscles and so on. 
when he's in the stable, um, he gets haylage um, and he also eats his straw. So he does actually come from Spain where straw is commonly fed um, as the primary forage. So it's quite hard to get Spanish horses to stop eating their straw um, usually. So, um, so what can we do for his weight? So again, quite different. This owner is not able to control the grass that he's on, um, but he spends more time in the stable than the others that we've seen. So there's some things we could do there. So, um, so firstly, reducing grazing. So we know the owner can't, like I said, she can't do anything about the actual grass in that field, um, in which case your answer for reducing grazing is a grazing muzzle. Um, and again, it would depend on this horse. Um, I believe he's, he's quite a cheery soul, so he might well do quite well in a grazing muzzle. Um, again, it depends how, um, what the state of the grass is like in that field um, and kind of his, his personality and what the owner is kind of willing to do. But that would be, um, would be a good option for him um, if he needed to lose weight urgently. In terms of his supplementary feed, so he spends a reasonable amount of time in the stable, which means he's getting a reasonable amount of forage. So um, we could do a way up of the amount of forage that he's having um, and what it is. So perhaps reducing, uh, doing a, a forage analysis, um, thinking about reducing to hay if the hay is less uh, calorific than the, the haylage, which it isn't always. Um, could think about soaking the hay, could think about things like using a trickle net on the right hand side there to make it take longer for him to eat. Or uh, one I really like is um, putting a, a trickle, some hay in a trickle net or the haylage, the bit they like in a trickle net and then uh, have um, a free amount of the one they don't like, you know, the really soaked hay or perhaps straw, for example, um, so that they have to work for the hay they like, for the forage they like, um, but less for the one they don't like. But it means you never have to worry about kind of leaving them as much. Um, and again, because we're not, um, we know he's already on the right track with his weight loss. We don't need to panic too much. Um, again, we can reconsider his bucket feed, um, although that's already been quite carefully looked at because of the um, rehabbing. Um, again, surprise, surprise, no rugs without reason. Again, this owner is worried about his weight, so he should not be wearing a rug unless there is a very good reason to do so. I don't know if I've said that enough times. Um, <laughs> you can tell I'm obsessed, sorry. Um, <coughs> so then we can think about increasing his exercise. So um, obviously, uh, this is quite timely for him because he's on a physio rehab uh, thing so he will be increasing his exercise anyway um, which is which is great so this owner is working with her yard um, yard owner who also helps to ride and exercise him and with the physio so that will be helping to um, increase the uh, calorie burn and obviously as he's rehabbing it's better to um, not have too much excess weight on his joints and bones and so on so that's going to be uh, really helping as well um, losing losing weight there I'm oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, so that's this guy. So basically, um, the main thing that we can do for this guy is probably going to be to reduce the forage that he's having in the stable, or perhaps think about the grazing muzzle, um, because the exercise is being increased anyway. But um, because it seems like with him, just that increased exercise is enough that it is doing something and re slowly reducing his weight, um, then hopefully he is on the right track. But these are things that the owner could consider if she. Um, if she needed to. So hopefully that's given you a kind of flavour of how you can think about your horse's weight management and why it's so important that we just break it down in these different ways um, into these four really simple quadrants rather than thinking, because weight management seems so scary overall, doesn't it? Like, it's like, oh God, I have to do all these horrible things that my horse doesn't like. But actually you don't, you can think about the things there are, you know, if you, um, for example, don't rug your horse and just increase the exercise, then you don't need to think about um, dieting the exercise dieting you know using um for example changing the horses grazing but you'd have to do a lot of exercise to do that and you'd have to really not rug but it is possible alternatively if you can't exercise there's still plenty you can do so it's really helpful to um to think about it in this way and we have a weight management guide which Dee has put the link to which will help take you through loads of different options for each of these ideas so ideas for um you know different exercise um things you can do and, and that sort of thing um, just briefly then, so really important for anything, any weight management you do, we often have to do things our horses don't like. So, you know, putting them up, taking them away from their friends, for example, or whatever. We need to think about um, 
how we can get we need to think about positive welfare so how can we make their lives nice <laughs> as nice as possible while we're doing that and that will help with issues like the escaping of the nice grey highland that you saw before um you know uh, if we can make their lives fun then that's going to happen less so you can see the nice yard there at the top with the scratch pads also a hay hutch um, giving horses toys so one of our guys really loves dog toys he'll play for hours with a dog toy which of course also means he's not eating um, giving your socializing your horse um, so the more social time they have together the better and a, a good way of thinking about this is just thinking you know if the horse is in a square paddock they have nothing to do but stand there and eat so the more interesting we can make their lives through their friends, through the environment um, being interesting, through toys, whatever it might be that they like, the less time they're going to be eating. And also it's fun for them and also for us. So just a couple of quick tips um, about how to succeed before I hand over to Dee. Um, so firstly, so I mentioned there is no magic answer. People always want kind of magic answers to weight management. There aren't really any, but if I had to say some, the best, the things that I think work for the most people, alternative grazing systems can work really well if done well, but there are also some really common things that people don't think about. So we'll talk about those more after Dee's talk. Um, so that's things like track systems and so on, which can be absolutely fantastic uh, when done right as long as you avoid the kind of common pitfalls which we'll talk about um, sharing the horse can work so well because there are so many people um, who I speak to who have maybe lost their confidence a bit with their horse or don't have enough time and if you just if you can if you've lost your confidence having a share is amazing because they'll actually like pay you and do your mucking out in order to basically do stuff with your horse that you don't like doing so your horse gets out and does it more and then if you want to you can also then build your confidence see your horse doing it it's great what's not to like um so sharing the horse i think is fantastic and most horses could be doing way way more exercise than they really are um so i think that's a really good option um if you if you are willing and have the opportunity um, and also just having fun with the horse, which is just totally, for some reason, we all spend our time poo picking, which is fun. Um, but we kind of forget, you know, probably when we bought our horses, we imagine beach rides and going, you know, for multi-day hacks and so on. Um, and how many of us really do those things <laughs> regularly? Um, but thinking about, you know, what you sort of hope to do with your horse and like, and, and then finding ways to plan it. Um, which also links with my, uh, my tip here, so my tip number one, uh, make it fun. So think about what you, actually enjoy doing with your horse maybe that's things like agility uh, maybe you want to try polo cross uh, that maybe you like galloping maybe you just like hacking out like the pony in the middle um, so you know what do you find fun and how can you do more of it basically um, and there are lots of um, in relation to that there are lots of these kind of online goals and challenges and um, competitions you can do which are really good and confidence building so um, the top is hack a thousand miles which some people here might be members of would love to hear from you if you are um, where you try and hack a thousand miles in a year um, and there are lots of people who sign up who um, for example have lost their confidence and they know they won't get to a thousand miles but they're just you know they're just doing what they can like they're aiming for a hundred a year or whatever that's totally fine as well so there's a really lovely and really supportive online community and it goes from you know people who are confident hacking around the village and that's all two people doing endurance so really lovely community uh, my hackathon um, is similar but it's 100 miles in a month I think um, for the charity the brook um, and then there are lots of online support um, and kind of challenge groups so into dressage which is um, you send in dressage tests and get uh, feedback they do in-hand ones as well as online connection training is just fantastic uh, that's positive reinforcement training um, in relation to everything horse handling riding gymnastic groundwork um, you name it they've got it um, and really fantastic support um, and very reasonably priced as well um, and the online horse agility club which gives you kind of monthly challenges and so on as well so find things that you think are fun set goals and crack on and do them and enjoy your horse uh, by exercising it and you know then wait before you know it weight management's fun who knew um tip three uh work with a friend and your professional support team so there's research in human weight loss which basically shows that if you team up with a friend have a what's called accountability buddy um then you'll work together and it makes you more likely to succeed uh, some yards do a really nice job of having like weight management clubs for horses um obviously it depends on your yard and <laughs> their kind of yard um 
community and how nice that's going to be. Um, but you can have like weigh-ins together, joint hacks, you know, clinics, get a weigh bridge out, all that kind of thing, um, and, and help each other to go riding, exercise your horses and so on. You can also, of course, always ask the professionals in your life to help you um, monitor your horse um, and uh, for ideas and so on. Tip four is to monitor, monitor, monitor and document it. So this really was highlighted by Claire McLeod last week in our talk, but it's so important. You monitor what you're doing. Um, ideally, take photos, take measurements, write it all down, because then you can see if your track system um, isn't uh it, you've got a lovely track system but your horse isn't losing weight then you need to change something if you've got um you know if you're soaking your hay for three hours um and your horse isn't losing weight you need to soak it for longer so if you monitor then you can see what's working and what's not so write it down so you can plan uh so you can see what's working Tip five is to plan for the difficult stuff. So this is the Welsh cob I mentioned uh, before. The photo on the left is him refusing to be caught because he didn't like his weight management, which meant he had to go in in a day. And the photo on the right is him uh, having been brought in a field in winter and I was not rugging him, as you can see, and I was hoping to arrive, but obviously that wasn't going to happen. So work out what's, going, what's right with, what's going to happen with your horse and then plan. So obviously um, in that situation, I need to, uh, whether I think about a lightweight rug on some days if I'm going to ride or just bringing him in earlier to ride and also on the left I needed to find weight management strategies that worked for him so that he was easy to catch because I didn't really want to be chasing him around the field but he did look very pretty when he was trotting around like that. Tip six. Oh, oh, did I say it again no rugs without reason I think I've probably harped on about that enough um, so the takeaway messages are, so you're not alone, there are lots of us trying to manage our horse's weight, um, which is fantastic and that's so responsible and, you know, stopping our horses from having long term problems and that's fantastic, but we can all work together on that. Um, weight management can be fun, so it's not just having to, you know, forcing yourself to ride your horse or strip grazing, you know, when you don't like strip grazing and mending your electric fences. And, um, you know, we can think about it in a bit more of a kind of broad way and hopefully find ways that are easier for us. There can be such a thing as the wrong yard. So if you can't change anything on your yard and you're not allowed a grazing muzzle, for example, you're not allowed to lunge and it just doesn't work, you can't find anything to do. And you've, you try, you're using those four quadrants and you can't change enough things to make your horse lose weight, then it's important for your horse's health to sometimes move yards, unfortunately. Um, I know that can be really tricky for people, but it, um, you know, unfortunately, it is the horse's health at the end of the day. Oh God, then I've said again, take off the rug. Uh, monitor, monitor, monitor. So endlessly checking, monitoring, um, uh, keeping an eye on those weight tapes or pieces of string or whatever you use, photos, um, and seeing what's working. And of course, always introduce all your changes very gradually. So don't just, you know, as Amelia pointed out, don't just put the grazing muzzle on, don't just whip your horse's rugs off. It, it does all need to be gradual um, and we need to always be thinking about the horse's welfare overall. So I will stop there. Um, I think I probably banged on enough. Take off the rugs. That's me. <laughs> Take off the rugs. Okay, I will stop sharing and I'll hand back over to Dee. Okay, Derek, so, uh, here we go, share screen. So I'll just spend maybe 10 minutes just talking through a case study. So we've spoken a bit about sort of individual management um, for like maybe one or two horses, but I thought it would also be cool to sort of um, do a case study looking at weight management of a herd. Um, and so this is just one option and kind of I'll take you through how we arrived at the strategy that we arrived at and then the results of how it worked. Okay, so setting the scene, we had a herd of Welsh ponies, so it was a, a relatively e um, big yard with um, at any time maybe between 30 to 40 ponies on site. Um, the majority of them were youngsters. So when I talk about sort of young and old ponies, young, I mean kind of yearlings and, and um, colts and fillies. And then kind of our older ones were between sort of two and, um, sorry, three and four years old. So um, the youngsters weren't so much of a concern, but um, the yard manager was finding with the older ponies, they were struggling to uh, control their weight. 
and two ponies, two of the older ponies had developed laminitis and so they needed really immediate intervention to get that weight off them as well as treating the laminitis. Um, and then the rest of the older ponies were at very high risk and so we wanted to also find a strategy that we could use for the whole herd and that that would help the older ponies lose weight but also prevent the younger ones as they get got older from actually becoming overweight. So what were the particular challenges with this situation? So sometimes a lot of land and grass can be a blessing but also sometimes a curse. So we had way too much grass and too few ponies. They did live in herds which was lovely for them but there was individual needs. So like for the very young ponies, we didn't need to be so careful about their management immediately, but for the older ones we did. And if you look at kind of um, the top picture on the right, that grass doesn't really look like there's much on there, but the ponies, and they weren't getting any supplementary feed, but they were still overweight. And even within this group of older ponies, there was individual variation. Some were quite overweight, Others looked okay, and some maybe even didn't look overweight. So that was really interesting to note. Um, so as these are all youngsters, they're not backed, so um, structured exercise is not an option. So if we look at kind of the four quadrants uh, from uh, Tamsin's talk, we can rule out sort of exercise and also just the amount of ponies that there were. Um, we can they couldn't really do sort of in hand stuff with them um, readily at an individual level. Um, they didn't get any supplementary feed. So really what we were looking at focusing on was the grazing management and also letting the ponies use their metabolism. So we also had to think about, so thinking back to Amelia's talk, sort of what owners said maybe prevented them from using different strategies. So we had to make whatever we decided to use easy for the yard staff and the yard manager to carry on with, because if you make something very difficult, it's likely people won't carry on with it if it's too time intensive um, and so on. We of course wanted to consider both the physical and the mental well-being of the ponies. We didn't want to restrict them too much or sort of isolate them. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were managing their weight, but also letting them be horses and still carry out their natural behaviors. And of course, we had to think about cost in an ideal world with, with unlimited money. We could probably set up a fantastic system, but we were quite limited on cost. So these ponies actually got weighed on a weigh bridge pretty regularly, once a month, if not more often. But nobody had kind of looked at what was happening with their weights long term. We saw them and we knew they were overweight, but you know, how, how did they get there? Let's have a look at what was the weight actually doing. So the first thing we did was we went back and we looked at the old records of their weight and just simply put them on a graph. So on the left, we've got the body weight in kilograms and along the bottom, sort of the, the months of the year, starting from January 2018 going forward. Um, and on the bottom is sort of what we would associate with seasons at different times of year. And do note that the weight doesn't start at zero. So we didn't have very, you know, some super underweight ponies. Um, so what we saw with this was that the weight was going up. Month on month, it was creeping up. And we didn't see any seasonal variation. So we often, when you speak to sort of nutritionists, vets and, and um, equine professionals, we want to see that sort of seasonal fluctuations. We, we want to see horses and ponies lose weight in winter, and then they have a little bit of leeway to then put on some weight when the grass starts growing. But um, th there was no weight loss in winter here. The ponies were just getting heavier. And then you can think, well, they are youngsters, so they, they, might, just, they might just be growing. But if, you, if we looked at their body condition, and scored them, they were all pretty much 4.5 or 5 on the body condition score scale. Um, so they weren't just growing vertically. Unfortunately, they were also growing sideways. So what sort of different things did we try? So we, uh, I worked together with the yard manager and yard vet. So it's really important to sort of get the people that will be carrying on these strategies on board and also great to have advice from a vet as well. 
So because they're sort of the yard manager and the yard staff were the ones that were going to be on the ground doing these things and carrying on with the weight management strategy. So the paddock sizes were quite large. So we looked at reducing the paddock size. But if we kind of wanted to do strip grazing on those large paddocks, it just would have been a complete nightmare moving large sections of fencing every day or every other day. So that wasn't really an option. So we tried to look at kind of a rotational grazing system where we would have the youngest and the slimmest ponies on the grazing first to graze it down a little bit. Then we would move them to another paddock and then we would get sort of the, the older ponies subsequently to to graze the, the paddocks that the youngsters had grazed on. We also put some paddocks aside, aside um, for making hay. We also got some, um, uh, rented out some paddocks to local cattle farmers to graze their cattle on. So this was all helping sort of keep the grass down. But uh, what I'm gonna sort of concentrate on is we, the special measures that we needed to do for the most overweight and the highest risk of laminitis, the older ponies. So with the laminitic ponies, the two of them, and we added another one with them who was sort of at very overweight as well. So we had three of them together. They were initially on a small bear paddock with so. So we were obviously waiting for the laminitics to recover before we kind of tried anything to get them to move around more. So we found that once they did recover and became sound again, this wasn't a really ideal strategy for them because they either just stood around in a small area and ate the hay. They also weren't very happy eating soaked hay, so they left a lot and they wasted a lot. And instead they would cut, sort of try and pick at the very, very short grass roots and probably just ate a lot of dirt. So they weren't moving and they weren't shedding weight, even on soaked hay. So we, put, uh, we had them in a relatively smaller area and we thought, well, we could try strip grazing, but once again, fencing issues, sort of moving large amounts of fencing every day, a temporary fencing that could be broken, um, didn't really work so well. So what we ended up settling with those three as a trial was using a combination of a grass track, but strip grazing it. Okay, so I'll show you how that looks. Oh no, I'm not gonna show you that yet. First, I'd just like to tell you that we, so it wasn't kind of a straight um, answer. We didn't suddenly say, okay, we're going to do a track system with the strip grazing. It took us a little bit of time to get to that point. We tried a few things, they didn't work. We tried other things and we kind of worked until we found something that did work. So as you can see, we implemented this track grazing system um, around sort of between March and April. And what we can see from the weights is that they went down. Um, so because we trialed it with the three ponies and it did work so well, we then subsequently did it with a, another herd of older ponies in a different paddock. So we actually had two herds going at the same time on this um, system. So what did we do? And this is um, the, the system we had for the three, so the two x and the uh, third one. So they started off in this uh, section of the field where they were, um, when they had laminitis and they were recovering. So the outer perimeter of the field is along the tree line that goes around the outside. And then we put in, we actually um, sunk in some wooden posts so to make the fence a little bit sturdier. So we're quite lucky that we were, we did have a, lot, a bit of leeway with the land. So we could, you know, make these changes and put in semi-permanent fencing. So we um, sectioned off um, this, inner, uh, this inner fence line. And because there was a lot of grass in the field at the time, we didn't just want to put the track up and then just let the ponies go on the track. So we strip grazed the track slowly, starting from here and working our way around. And you'll also note it's not a completely circular track. It does end at this point. Uh, the blue circle represents the water source. So that means that by the time the ponies had grazed their way around the outside of the track, um, if they wanted to have a drink, they would have to walk back around. And we did find that they did this more and they also moved as a herd. So if one or two of them went, the third would follow. So it did anecdotally seem to make them move more. Then once they had grazed around the perimeter of the track, 
we started off um, making small lanes on the inside and then slowly strip grazing these lanes till we reached the end. We would shut that lane off and then um, open up a new lane. That also meant that it allowed some of the grass on the inside of the track to recover. And we had greater control over how much the ponies were eating. Um, right, so here's some pictures of the three musketeers on their track system. Um, making their way back uh, to the water and uh, and by the water was also a small crew yard and they also had access to um, the barn shelter if they wanted to use it. Now as Tamsin said enrichment is also something that you can implement as well so here we have some homemade slow feeders that are filled with I think the lowest calorie chaff that we could find some mostly straw I think with a light coating of something and we kind of wetted the chaff and put it into these, I think they were um, doormats, if I'm mis not mistaken. And it kind of let the ponies kind of slowly lick and nibble the chaff out of there. And that, that helped keep them occupied. This is the second track that we had um, six ponies on. So it was a slightly bigger area. And the nice thing here, is they also had a lot of trees for shelter around the outside of the track. And here you can see a picture of the field shelter, although they didn't tend to use it very much. And we had a similar system with these ponies, just in a bigger field. So just to go back to this picture, so what that allowed us to do, it meant that when we were strip grazing, we were only moving a short sort of um, amount of fencing at a time. We didn't have sort of massive lengths of electric fencing that we had to move when we were giving them more grass. So that worked very well. And these lands in the middle could be set up um, in advance. So then once again, you only have to move this little strip as much as you like. So the results, what did we see? So these are ponies before. Um, I didn't have a picture of this young lady um, quite before we started all of this. This is about midway through using the track system. So you can imagine what she looked like at the start. And we have, um, this is what they looked like in September 2019. So if you remember back to the graph, in about March, April, we started using the system. And by September that year, these ponies were looking brilliant. And it also then allowed us, because they had gotten down to a nice weight, it allowed us to then um, take them off that grazing system as we were going into winter and integrate them into that rotational system. And they actually did very well over winter and they didn't pile on even more weight like they were doing the previous winter. And remember our three amigos, so the two laminetics and the other very overweight one. And this is what they looked like in September 2019. So, and no more episodes of laminitis, importantly. So the take home messages from this, so this is only one option out of many to consider. And when you are trying to think of a strategy for you and your horse, um, try to be creative. You know, we don't always have to stick to rectangular pieces of grazing um, as our paddocks usually come in. Um, it's very important to continue monitoring the weight and condition of your horse throughout this process. If nothing is happening, if their weight isn't decreasing and you're trying to decrease it, then try something new. You know, don't be afraid to adapt your strategy and change it. Um, so here the main focus was on controlling the amount of grass the ponies ate um, because we couldn't do exercise and they weren't really getting any supplementary feed. So grass, most importantly, we could um, of course, we didn't rug, they weren't rugged in winter, so they did use their metabolism. But even when you look back at the grass, because they had so much grass, even that metabolism on its own wasn't enough to get them to lose weight in winter until we started limiting their grass. And informal observations show that the ponies were more active and tended to move more as a herd, although we didn't sort of take formal measurements of the amount they moved. So really thinking about can we find the best balance between keeping our ponies, uh, ponies physically fit, but also keeping them mentally stimulated? Um, and finally, of course, don't be afraid to ask for help and guidance from horse care, professional, uh, from horse care professionals. Um, we're always here for you, um, as well as your vet, um, your farrier could be of help, your physio, anyone else that does see your horse on a regular basis. Um, don't be afraid to sort of ask for their help and guidance. 
So thank you very much. And that's me done. So I will stop sharing my screen. Awesome, thanks Dee. That's so good to see. So the before and after pictures of their pon those ponies are amazing. Yeah, they look fantastic, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so um, so Dee and I, and hopefully Amelia, uh, will ask. Uh, will be happy to answer some questions. There's some on the chat already. Oh, we have Amelia. Hi, Amelia. Hey. Do you just wave and say hi? Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, thank you yeah. for joining us. <laughs> okay. Oh, also, just quickly, yeah, sorry. Really sorry, good talk, guys. Uh, well, thank you. Not as good as yours. <laughs> um, sorry, I just can see in the chat that my internet went a bit funny in the middle, so apologies. But um, probably you all got the gist that I was saying take off rugs quite a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless there's a reason, obviously. That, that's what everyone's going to take away from this. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe, shall I ask you? Um, I've want to start okay uh yeah okay cool uh i'll i'll take a question um and then we can we can all have a go at answering it if that's okay um so Anne has asked are there any suggestions for keeping a grazing muzzle on a plait into the mane but he has been known to get the head collar over both ears so it's only held on by the plait and it's not comfortable or safe um either of you guys want to take on any from that one I think I'll let Amelia go because I don't have personal experience of grazing muzzles that much. Um, so I don't know if maybe people might try this anyway, but something that I've done before is um, to get a get a fly, a fly mask over the top of the saw. You can get this. Obviously, some fly masks also come off quite easily, but I can't, I can, can't remember what brand is, but I can try and look that up. But we had one that kind of went quite tightly under the chin and had like a really big Velcro bit which managed to keep my pony where she used to roll and try and like rub it off and she didn't manage to get it off most of the time with the head collar with the grazing mask um, no sorry fly mask on um and so yeah maybe a, a kind of a fly mask with a good strong velcro or other things that I've done before is you could try putting on another head collar over the top as well although that does kind of that could increase the risk that the horse could catch on something in the field um if you have like kind of quite a clear clear area that could be something you could try um but also, um, my grandma, when she was using um, grazing muzzles on our ponies as well, she sewed, sewed some kind of extra straps. So I think, I don't know if you could see in the pictures from my talk, but some of the time ones, they have like a big cross. She sewed one, I think, kind of a, kind of like a little brow band bit around the front of it and a cross down the front. Oh, yes, the... I would see that sort of. Yeah, yeah so cool. that's my, my grandma. When I, was, when I was younger, my grandma added those. Um, <laughs> And I had, she made like a little, yeah, yeah, bit kind of brow band bit and cross over the front, which also seemed to help help keep on. So there could be things um, to try as well. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Thank cool. you. Yeah, I guess the other thing is just maybe trying the different brands. But if you have, I know I've got a friend with a little Welsh, well, she's got the smallest ears in the world and it is a real problem. I think it's, you know, often the plats are the best you can do in that situation or, or if it's really bad, use an alternative strategy if you have to. But <laughs> sounds like Amelia's got some good, good thoughts there. Thank you. Okay, there was a question here. Um, is the supplement Metaslim a good idea or only exercises and uh, diet? Um, I'm just giving an opinion on that, but do you want to, do you want to go, Dee? Um, I well, it's really hard to say whether supplements work or not. Um, I think a lot of the sort of information is anecdotal. So I think whatever you do, don't rely on the supplement. That's I think the most important message. Um, exercise, diet first, definitely. Those are your first ports of call. Um, if you do want to try a supplement, it's not going to do any harm probably, but don't sort of rely on feeding the supplement that that's suddenly going to make your horse lose weight if you don't if you aren't doing other things already yeah that's pretty much my thoughts as well i don't think there's any scientific information or studies that back up the use of supplements like metaslim but there is anecdotal lots of people say that they think they make a big yeah. difference so it's not gonna yeah it's, it's probably it's, you know it's worth a try but you know that alone isn't isn't going to unfortunately solve all the problems <laughs> i think yes if, if there was a pill that we could take to Imagine. make a slim 
yeah, I'll be the first one, but yeah, <laughs> nothing like that exists. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so what else have we got here? People are drawing no rugs without reason. Thank you. Oh, I've got one. Um, okay. Sorry, I wrote down a, a, a few at, right at the beginning. Oh, great. So when we spoke about sort of feeding straw, we had a question whether barley or wheat straw. Um, my impression is that barley straw is a bit more palatable. Mm. So horses might be more inclined to eat it. Um, so probably if you can get hold of barley straw, that's nice sort of good quality, not too dusty, barn mm. stored, um, then probably try that. Mm. Yeah. Or oat straw, I think can work. I think Claire said last week about using, yeah. you know, that, um, I, I don't know for how long this has been available for, but um, the, the stuff that's like, they sell as, like dust extracted straw in the plastic packaging which you can uh, use as bedding yeah, or okay. feed. so it's been chopped a bit more it's not not as much as a chaff but like less than so it's, it's more uh, like okay. shavings if you see what i mean it's quite yeah, useful yeah, as bedding. Yeah. but um because it's dust extracted that that's quite nice for them which is a good idea i guess as well for you know dodgy teeth and so on as well so i guess that's a, yeah, yeah definitely um yeah because i think that's one thing um you know if your horse doesn't have the best teeth then sort of feeding straw might not be um, a good idea but then maybe check with your vet or whoever does your horse's dental work mm. um, to see whether they think the horse could have some straw um, right I'll cover that um, oh this is this was quite an interesting question I think um, so if a horse if a horse is on grass and it looks like there is really nothing there, so I presume it looks almost like a bear paddock, but they are still not losing weight, is it okay to leave them on the grass until they lose weight without harming their intestinal system with not enough forage? That's a good question. Oh. Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind having a start on that one. Um, I think it's impossible to give um it would be um unprofessional to give generic advice based on that because it does depend on the situation and exactly how bare you really mean um and on the situation with the horses and how big the paddock is and all, all those sorts of things but um obviously it is important so horses need at least 1.5 percent of their well, so on a diet a horse needs 1.5 percent of its body weight in dry matter so it does need enough forage to be going through and if you if you if they don't have enough forage that is actually dangerous for them so we don't want to be starving them by any means um you can make them quite sick doing that um however it's really tricky because there is usually a lot more coming through than you think so um, it's really hard to answer I, personally depending on the situation um if that was me and i'm imagining this to kind of look like pretty much brown with like a few shoots coming through i would be tempted to do soaked hay and maybe straw on that as well so that you know they've got something to nibble on um you could always put it in a hay ball as someone's asked about there um or in you know trickle nets that sort of thing so they do have to work for it um just to make sure that they are getting enough um if they need it um but Another thing you can do is sometimes if you just fence off like a tiny, tiny bit of it and then see how much grass is growing just in that tiny section. So just like the amount of a um, manhole cover or something, you can see how much is coming up and then you can see what your horse is eating every day. That's quite a good way of doing it. Or you can count the number of droppings to see what they're going through. Um, but the fact that you say they're not losing weight probably does suggest, unless there's an underlying method you know, metabolic problem or something probably does suggest they're getting more than you think they are. Um, so yeah, hard, hard to say without seeing it, but you know, maybe worth a chat. You could always chat with your vet when they're there and get their advice on what your paddock looks like and so on and the individual situation. That's what I would say. Any other thoughts on that from you two? Um, I'd say if, but also maybe if you have time, you could see, watch your horse for a bit and see if it is eating a lot, if it's like spending time grazing or if whether it's just standing around because if it is spending time grazing and seems to manage to get something, it probably is um, managing to get something to eat. Mm, as well. This is true. Yeah, good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, kind of, I, I agree with both of those. Um, it's it's quite hard to kind of give, yeah, as you say, generic advice without knowing um, all the other background. Um, but definitely watching them: are they eating? How much poo are they making? Um, and potentially, if you think that they're not getting or if they're still not losing weight on that amount of grass can you 
then rather maybe reduce the area of the grass, but give them then supplementary feed so you can better control what they're eating and then see whether they lose weight that way, which could also maybe tell you actually how much they were getting from that area of grass they were originally on. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, and then, um, so Anne uh, likes your straps, grazing muzzle straps. <laughs> Amelia, that's a good one. <laughs> but she has tried the fry, fly mask. Uh, the, the, it is hard, yeah. But making the straps sounds good. That's brilliant. I hope uh, you have some luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe your Nan should go into business marketing. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm just laughs> um, Suzanne says, I think this is for you, Dee. How often did you move the fence on the track system for the ponies and how much by? So that is very hard to answer because <laughs> it varied. We didn't sort of set an amount that we moved the fence by. We based it on monitoring the horses, um, the ponies' weights. So if we saw that the weights were going up, we sort of gave them less. Um, it was summertime, so it was relatively dry, but then we would have spells of warm, wet weather for a couple of days, and then the grass would grow again. So you also kind of have to take that into account um, because then you'll have more grass on the previous area that they had already grazed as well. Um, so definitely it was a little bit of a kind of, you know, take it day by day kind of thing. Um, so unfortunately no set answer to that. Yeah, interesting. It's such a tricky one, isn't it, to get the right amount without, um, yeah. Yeah, and you could also kind of tell when they, um, if they weren't getting enough, they, you know, they would get a little bit, a little bit hangry and mm. then you would, you would know to, to do something about it mm, yeah that's interesting did you have any um thoughts on that not necessarily for tracks but strip grazing specifically from your study amelia like how much to move fences by or you know what people found did or didn't work um i think for my most people in my questionnaire said that they um just based off how much they thought the grass was growing mm, okay. um based on how quickly they did it so maybe like they're like like you said tamsin you could fence mm -hmm. off like a little separate bit and that might be able to give you an idea of how quickly the grass is growing as well for a bit that the ponies aren't grazing down mm -hmm. um and you could use that um use that as a guide but yeah i think mm -hmm. it, it does depend on how much yeah i guess see maybe and also again if you have time to watch them see how long they're grazing for before they stop and if they mm -hmm. if they're kind of continuing to graze most of the day or not obviously mm -hmm. you have to have a kind of spare time to do that yeah or yeah. some surveillance cameras yeah, yeah. Also, well. <laughs> yeah fit bit horse fit bits <laughs> all the tech <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, Sally has pointed out honey chopped or chopped oats straw, which is true. Yeah, good point. Thank you. And then top chop zero is another one actually that um, is pretty useful for people. That's what we want to do. Uh, we've got an interesting one from Audra. She says, my horse is overweight. He's on a grass track during the day and a grassless yard at night, but with hay. I'd like to cut out his bucket feed completely, but he's fussy about eating his bits and mittens unless it's delivered in something tasty, fibre beets. He turns up his nose at the chop. Do you have any suggestions? Any thoughts on that or do you want hmm. me to go? Um, well, just kind of thinking off the top of my head, there probably are some balances that are really low calorie that sort of come in little pellets that might be a bit more palatable um, than just giving vitamins and minerals. And you probably might want to include some extra protein as well if, if they are being restricted. Um, so that might be an option to look into. I think most most of the feed companies do like very low calorie um, balances. And I think with balances as well, because you're feeding such a small amount, it's very concentrated with sort of vitamins and minerals and such. It's probably not going to make a huge amount to making your horse put on weight. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I don't know what, what your guys' thoughts are. Um, personally, I think I agree with that. It's yeah, so it's important they obviously get their vitamins and minerals and also some protein, um, with enough protein. Um, so yeah, I, I would say it's, I mean, depending on how much fiber beet you're giving, probably it doesn't sound like the bucket feed, assuming it's not loads, <laughs> um, it doesn't sound like the bucket feed is probably going to be as contributing as much to his diet as potentially the grass track, depending on how much grass is on it. And, and maybe the hay at night um so it is amazing how much 
they can get in from those things. Um, so depending on how much grass is on the track, so that there have been some studies that show that um, if there is enough grass, they can eat in just four hours, their entire day's allowance of hay. So, um, sorry, of, sorry, that entire day's allowance of, um, of forage, which is pretty impressive. And that's in grass. Um, so if, if the grass, if the track that they're going out onto has a lot of grass, then that's probably going to be a much bigger issue than what's in your feed bucket um, and doing the maybe strip grazing could be really helpful or potentially um, forage testing the hay that you're giving him or maybe um, maybe soaking it. So yeah, I'd agree with the balance uh, um, idea um, and maybe reducing the amount of fiber beets if you can, but I probably wouldn't be um, too concerned as long as it's not a huge amount that's actually in the bucket compared to what he's getting elsewhere personally. Do you have any thoughts, Amelia? Uh, I think most of you guys have mostly covered it all now from um, what I can think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I think we often um, we often think about, you know, or oh, bucket feed is, is what's making them put the weight on. But actually, I mean, if you look at those Welsh ponies, they weren't getting anything. They were getting all their weight gain just from that mm -hmm. poor looking grass paddock. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely kind of the, the grass and the hay because hay can be really calorific. Mm -hmm. So depending on kind of what's in your hay, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, definitely something else to consider. It's not, not just about what's in the bucket, but mm -hmm. the total amount, um, amount and type of what your horse is eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Claire McLeod is really clear on that last week as well, wasn't she, about saying that she yeah. sees, now she sees some types of hay that are like kind of rocket fuel and you don't know it by looking at it, but actually the the um amount of energy that's provided in the hay is way more than like a typical haylage for example whereas yeah the definitely was, was more calorific yeah. yeah it's interesting yeah, i mean you might look at hay and think like oh it looks like straw but mm -hmm. you can't assume that it's it's got the same or mm -hmm. less nutrients than a hay that looks really green and mm -hmm. you know so definitely yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, a crest question. Is there anything you have come across that will help reduce the crest in a late cut horse who is otherwise not overweight and not diagnosed with EMS? Well, <laughs> we'll be following up on crests in an upcoming, um, in our next talk, uh, well, probably next but one, um, when we have some vet input because we think crests are really interesting and they, um, there's actually not that much research into them. Um, uh, I'll just give a quick thing on this because I was chatting with um, uh, Professor Kathy McGowan, who's head of the vet school at Liverpool, um, Liverpool uh, University's vet school there. Um, so no one really knows about much about crests, but they're very, very interesting. Um, so with a horse like that, it's likely that they've kind of built up. Did you say late? Oh, yeah, late cut. Yeah. So she says, basically, that um, a horse who it, that crests are kind of permitted on stallions, or therefore late cut horses, but it is still fat. So that fat will probably always be there, but it is fat. So you do have to keep an eye on it. So she wouldn't, um, we had this with the horse, the Spanish horse in my talk who we conditioned scored last week. Um, although you can't totally see it in the picture that I showed today, he has quite a big crest and was, I think he um, was cut at eight. Um, so condition scoring, um, we don't, really worry about it but we do have to keep an eye on whether it's getting bigger so again it's a case of monitoring it and also checking whether it's getting hard um so if it's um if we're getting that kind of like um hard you can't wobble it um that kind of thing then um that's obviously quite worrying um and if it's increasing then obviously that also means the horse is putting on more weight but you won't ever really get rid of it um the fact that your horse has ems as well is makes it a bit more complicated because um, we don't really know much about EMS and crests. Um, so yeah, I think, I'm not sure you can probably get rid of it given that the horse isn't overweight. Um, it may be something that you just have to live with. Um, anecdotally, people do talk about magnesium, cinnamon, and metaslim, those sorts of things, sometimes reducing crests. Um, but again, it's only anecdotal evidence. So that would be my very mixed and, and uncohesive answer. <laughs> but we can talk more about this when we have that um, in a couple of weeks' time. So, uh, Dee and Amelia, any thoughts? No, no oh, comments from you. No, I don't know much about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, definitely, it's something we need to come back to, I think, in future talks because it's super yeah. interesting. I've got a bit of a weird crest obsession now. <laughs> um, okay. 
So we're probably, because we're heading into kind of quarter past 10, we'll probably just take a couple more questions and I think maybe then we'll let people get off to bed. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, next, uh, Dawn says, what's your opinion on Equigel and Lamigel? It helps my mare's intake of water. Um, we're not nutritionists, so I don't think we can have a nutritional answer on our opinion, but um, yeah. water intake is good, definitely. Um, and some people really swear by it. Um, others not like any fees, I would say. Um, I think that's probably a question for a nutritionist, I would say, but yeah. if you guys have any thoughts particularly. I'm not even kind of sure what's in those products. So yeah, they're alfalfa based. I don't know where, oh, is it? Yeah, um, I think I think almost purely, um, which obviously is, doesn't suit some horses anyway. Um, we we've used them with our endurance horses to get them to take in more water, um, but we don't use them as a complete feed, although many people do. I'd say they're pretty good. Gorgeous um, horses and eating machine. We know the feeling. <laughs> Um, what's your opinion regarding thiamine and magnesium for fat pads and crests? Oh, that, that can be the last one. <laughs> oh, I think that is the last one. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't, has there been any evidence? I can't think of any papers that have been published. Um, and I know sometimes we'll get studies of, perhaps done in like labs in mice and things. And I think maybe they'll show something like, I think one of them was cinnamon showed potential at mm -hmm. um, helping insulin dysregulation. And I think we always have to remember that these are kind of very um, basic studies done at quite a, you know, in a very set experimental setting done in another species. Um, and it takes a lot of work before that can kind of translate into, well, probably go first into humans and then, um, horses are probably a bit down the line to get these um, research into things like that. But I don't think we have any kind of strong evidence for it uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, so I would always just go back to that, you know, focus on that exercise and that management um, as much as you can. And then, you know, you could try supplements and things um, to see if they make any difference. But I think, you know, your, your core things are your exercise and your management. And the rugs. Yes, no, doe rugs. Unless you have, oh, somebody did mention, <laughs> unless you have ponies with sweet fish. <laughs> yeah, then, sorry. Then okay. um, I've got two. So then rugs are allowed, but mm. only to stop the midges biting them. Yeah, um, sorry, I do sympathize with the sweet fish. <laughs> <like that. laughs> yeah. Okay. Shall we I call don't know, it Amelia, here? did you have any, do you know anything about magnesium and thiamine? Um, no, sadly not. I haven't, I haven't seen any papers about about them in relation to that post or anything and I haven't had experience of using them either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of these things are just anecdotal, but people do say they they really think it has helped them. So again, it's probably not going to do any harm. So <laughs> but always best to work with a vet. Especially magnesium seems to be in a lot of supplements and I don't know if you can over supplement with it. So sometimes I do think it's worth checking yeah, on that maybe with your vet. But isn't it used sort of it's meant to be like using a lot of karmas as well, mm. isn't it? Yeah, mm. and laminitis supplements as well. So and some people additionally feed it as well for barefoot and, okay. and so on. So yeah, I don't um I actually don't know off the top of my head if you can over supplement, but um yeah, it's worth checking if you're using lots of different things at once. Not just for magnesium but for other things too. And I think also we have to remember that when we are doing weight management, we're sort of changing multiple things at once and so we might be changing management and exercise and adding a supplement and then we might think the supplement's working but actually we're forgetting all the other changes that we've made mm. um so just something to keep in mind mm. yeah definitely we all want a magic answer <laughs> but we just have to ride our horses <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and take off their rugs yes <laughs> <laughs> I said in a nutshell. Yes, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, I think um, that's the end of our questions. Um, is it? Yeah. I think so. Thank you, everyone. Lovely to have so many people with us. And thank you, Amelia, for joining us today as well. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you for having us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yeah, if you have any other questions, just let us know on the care pages. We're always happy to chat, as you can tell. And hopefully join us next week. We're going to have um, another session 
we're going to be looking at how to monitor your horse's um, condition and weight long term. And we'll also have a talk from a vet at Rossdale's, Lucy Griever, who's, Grieve, who's going to tell us about um, some of the things that BEVA, so the British Equine Veterinary Association, has been doing to help owners manage their horse's weight. Lots more coming. Oh, and if anyone has ideas for future sessions that you particularly want, we have lots of ideas, but, um, you know, would be keen to hear things that you actually want as well. So feel free to. Yeah. And after, I think next week's one, we're probably going to look at doing it sort of um, every second week rather than weekly. Um, so we'll, we'll still be doing them, but not as often. Yeah, cool. Right. Well, sweet dreams, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.